This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell, and joining me in the studio today are the Toledo Symphony's music director, Alain Trudel, also the TSO's president and CEO, Zach Vassar, And we have a very special return guest here in the studio. I've got a fanfare for you. Please welcome Effie Papa Nicolau to the studio. Did you recognize that piece of music? Uh, yes. <laughs> and for those who didn't recognize it, it's the Greek national anthem. <laughs> yeah, the short version. Yeah, the I was very say short that it was version. Slightly abbreviated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't have all day, and we are here to talk about Mahler today. Never, and never Effie, heard of him. Effie, you're here to to tell us all about uh, Mahler and Mahler's Symphony Number no. Three, which is being performed by the Toledo Symphony. It's happening on Friday and Saturday night, June 2nd and 3rd, 8 o'clock p.m. at the Paris style. Elaine Trudeau will be at the podium. Music of Gustav Mahler and sung by Mezzo Susan Platz, who we may remember was here last year singing with the symphony as well. So, Effie, thank you for joining us today. We haven't seen you in a while. It's been a long while, since 2019. Yeah. Yeah. When you did the second symphony by Mahler, and we were here. And, you know, I think the Symphony Number no. 3 may have been done around 2009, something like that. Uh, it was when I first came here. It was one of the first things that I ever saw the symphony play. It was uh, 2009, yeah. Yeah, right. I remember that. Well, it, you know, this is going to be an entirely different take for those of us who went to that uh, that concert back in 2009. So that's been, what, 10, 12 14 years. I was told there is no math. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me get out my slide rule and I'll, I'll get back with you. But now, Effie, I know that you've prepared a little bit to tell us about Mahler and put Mahler in context with the Symphony Number no. 3. And, and Elaine is going to test you on all of this later. <laughs> but we, let, let, let's get a little sense of what um, the Symphony Number no. 3, where it fits in with everything else that, that Mahler wrote. So it c- does come after the second symphony. It's not like other That's composers. That's why they call it symphony number three, right? <laughs> now don't be mean. <laughs> um, it is a highly philosophical composition, like mostly everything that Mahler composed. It is his longest symphony. For a while there, people thought, oh, the eighth symphony, which is sung throughout, and it has this... this m- momentous, gigantic forces that that was the longest, but no, it's the third symphony. Mm -hmm, And it depending on who conducts this symphony, and (laughs) you will tell us, Alain, how long it takes you. (laughs) It may take an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 40 minutes (laughs) or an hour and 50 minutes. They're they're motioning for you to (laughs) increase the time. It's so interesting, though, because I don't... This is not a... um, a symphony that is pleasurable when it's done quickly. I think Uh, there are definitely (laughs) fast recordings out there, but if you get to one of those uh, hour and 20 minutes fits on one CD sort of things, I never enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no magic in there. So basically what you're saying is that the the longer, the better. Uh, Not necessarily. Uh, (laughs) That can also backfire as I think we've all, experience but yeah but, but we in want this to give case it, it works we want to give it its full due this is like the most i i've read this is the most autobiographical or the most i i guess descriptive symphony that Mahler ever wrote it kind of seems like a miniature opera to me i mean you've mm-hmm. got the chorus that makes an appearance as well as the vocal soloist what's your take on that Mahler is always theatrical no matter what he writes yeah. and that is amplified also by the offstage instruments and i have a specific questions question about that <laughs> for you yeah. alan um it is in six movements 
And it's worth knowing that he actually planned a seventh movement. Mm -hmm. And then he went against that decision and he said, no, 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 I'm going to leave the, this uh, seventh movement for my fourth symphony. And that became the solo part of the fourth symphony. So we have six movements. Uh, one of them is kind of short for Mahler, five, <laughs> five minutes. Wow. Right? Uh, and then we have the gigantic first movement. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. which is about 30, 35 minutes mm -hmm. long. How yeah. long does it take you, Alan? Uh, around half an hour, yeah. 33, something like that. Something like that. Well, something like that. I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. think anybody's going to be, you know, sitting there checking their watch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your, uh, <laughs> clocks in at exactly yeah. 30 minutes. Now, the voices that you mentioned come in in the fourth movement mm -hmm. and the beginning of the fifth movement. So the fourth movement is an entire song a song that comes from the, the youth's magic horn, which was mm -hmm. the favorite collection of poetry that Mahler had set to music earlier. Yeah. So he's using one of these, of these songs for the fifth movement. And then the fourth movement is, is an incredible, incredible work for, uh, for solo alto on poetry, and I dare say poetry here, mm -hmm. yeah. by Friedrich Nietzsche. Yeah. based on his also sprach Zarathustra, or also spoke Zarathustra. Yeah, which we all know from Richard Strauss's tone poem, based on that as well, and, and the int opening. Interestingly, yeah. written exactly the same year. Oh, really? So hmm. Mahler worked on the symphony in the summers of 1895 and 1896, and Strauss premiered his tone poem in November of 1896. Wow. So what, um, you know, what, what was going on in Mahler's life at the time? He was working in Hamburg. Mm. Uh, he was working in Hamburg as a conductor. He had taken over the position of Hans von Bülow, who was this incredible musical figure in European music, pianist, conductor, associated with Wagner, associated with Liszt, with all these people. And he had a very busy schedule. So the only time he had the time to compose was in the summer. And in the mm -hmm. summer, he would go to this beautiful house by a lake in Upper Austria. And he had a little hut. You probably have seen pictures of this hut if you are a Mahler person, uh, where he would go there at <laughs> six o'clock in the morning and he would start composing nonstop until noon. And then he would take a break, he would take a walk, and then he would go back to compose. And that was his schedule throughout the summer, every summer. Oh. So he used those two summers in 1895 and 1896 to get away from Hamburg, from his busy schedule conducting to write this symphony. Here's an interesting fact, though. He goes back to Stein, Steinbach um, and he realizes in 1896, I have forgotten the sketches for the first movement of the symphony. Mm -hmm. They are back in Hamburg. So he contacts a friend of his in Hamburg and Hamburg is not close. It's yeah. far, far away, north of Germany. So he contacts somebody and he says, could you please go into my office and get the sketches because I need to finish this symphony and I'm freaking out right now. I hate, I hate when that happens. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. So this person actually sends him the, the music and now he's able to write as a prequel the first movement. He had already composed the rest of the movements oh, and now okay. he has to write and complete the first movement. And there is a letter there in which he's saying, I am so upset right now, and I don't know what is going to happen until I have these sketches in front of me because I worry that they might be delivered to the wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> you just think about that getting lost in the mail, right? Yeah. Or, and, or somebody finding it like, you know, Count Valsek and Mozart <laughs> who wants to redo the, the, the Requiem and claim it as his own. Exactly. I, look at this symphony I wrote. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just a little ditty. <laughs> 33 minutes. But it's really interesting because it, there's a, a little bit of power of the subconscious in it. Because, you know, from his sketches, writing the rest, he still had his sketches in his mind. So when he went back to the first movement, there's elements of the first movements. It's not as cyclic as other, other of his works, but still, you still have a lot of elements, especially 
using the horn call of the beginning and many different aspects of the, especially in the last moment when it comes back. It's uh, it's interesting because it's like it's like when uh, great classical composers wrote uh, the re-exposition without having their music and just trying to remember it. Mm. Not, you don't do a quote unquote a cut and paste job, right? Yeah. So for him, it was actually a, I mean, it was very stressful, but it was actually a good thing. <laughs> it yeah. could be. Yeah. Could Nowadays be. we can cut and p- paste, so <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's no excuse. <laughs> So that brings up the interesting question of, of what order he wrote those movements in, how the symphony came together. I mean, why was he looking for those sketches? Was it to get back in the groove or to actually refer to those earlier in the symphony, as uh, Elaine has talked about a little bit? I mean, how did that come about? He needed to complete the first movement. Yeah. And that's the process you write some sketches and you have some ideas and that's what he had done in the previous summer, but he had no time to complete the first movement. So he needed those sketches to be able to actually finish the first movement. Okay, so the sketches were of the first movement. Of the first yeah. movement. Okay. Yes. Well, never mind, as Emily Lazella <laughs> would say. Uh, speaking of, of Mahler people, you mentioned, you know, a Mahler person would know. Zach, you're definitely a Mahler person. You want to tell us about... <laughs> Your obsession, for lack of a better word, with uh, music of Mahler? Uh, sure. Uh, so I don't have my coffee cup with me, but it says on the back of it, um, because I was up too late listening to Mahler. <laughs> <laughs> um, my obsession began with the Third Symphony. Uh, there was a Toledo Symphony performance in the mid-90s, and I attended it, and it was the most moving experience of my life. Uh, to that point, and certainly in the top top ten still um and I remembered i i it was it was the winter time and i had a i had a cold and um at the f- the final moments of the last movement, you have the dual timpani and um everything is going so beautifully and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I had this, um, I couldn't take any more information. And I remember looking at the ceiling of the Paris style just because I couldn't, I just needed like a blank surface to stare at. And tears are coming down my cheeks and I can't breathe through my nose because it would make just an awful noise. And I just remember choking on, on air and tears. And wow. I came home and... um I remember talking to my, my parents about it, and I said, you know, the first movement is as long as some of the Mozart symphonies, and then you go from there. And, uh, you know, there's the subtitles of each of the movements, but, you know, there was a, a story, I don't know if true, I referenced to you, Effie, but um, the last movement is what love tells me, and he reportedly had said, that we might as well call this what God tells me, because the only way to really know uh, love is to know God and vice versa. And I, and I, I always think about that when you hear that, that symphony and that finale, it's just, it's so great. And, mm. and then the floodgates open and I, um, I've now seen every Mahler symphony at least once. <laughs> and, um, this will be my fourth, third, I think. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the symphony has done a lot of Mahler in recent years. And, and have you been the, the driving force behind that, Zach? Or well, what? I, I, people like to say that. I like to say that. Um, it's not true, though. I mean, before I, I came to the symphony, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, your predecessor was doing a Mahler symphony every year. Uh, we were taking our way right through the, the cycle. Started with a nine, then it went to one, two, three, and then four never happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Which is funny because, you know, four... Four and one should be the most frequently played Mahler symphonies, but it was quite a while until yeah. Stefan's last year that he did the fourth. But, you know, it okay. is a workout. It's a, it's a workout for the musicians. It's deeply personal music, and I think that a good orchestra should play Mahler well, and you, that means you need to continue to practice. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hear the conductor's point of view as far as Mahler goes. I mean, it, it's got to be a huge undertaking for you on the podium as well, working to bring out the world of the symphony in, in Mahler's music. The thing with Mahler is that for musicians, it's probably one of our favorite composers, and like every player in the orchestra as well. So there's a, 
there's a sense of um, anticipation whenever we we see the season and there oh there are like one or two Mahler symphonies in the season where like, everybody's very excited looking forward to it so everybody's been preparing for a long time so there no need to motivate the troops or well mind you they don't need <laughs> motivation for any of the shows <laughs> they're, they're a great group but uh, what's really what's really uh, a challenge each time is the architecture because it's so enormous right it's monumental yeah so the architecture of the of the first movement is one thing but the idea of the whole thing and also Mahler for me is a there's something uh like he wanted to be like an uh, how do you say an estet is that what mm-hmm. you call it? like an estet but at the same time want to be a man but at the same time you know it needs to be like um uh a, um a figure that uh, of authority but at the same right. time he's very sensitive so it's, there's so many contradiction in this pr- personality he's such a complicated person uh like you know how much he loved alma but at the same time he treated her so badly <laughs> so, yeah. you know so without realizing that he was no, doing no, that no know? he's a, a, like a lot of creator uh, he has to think of his creation first. And you think the summer, well, summer was also the only time that he could have really family time, but, yeah. you know, he needed to compose. So it's, but he knew inside of him that it was taking him away from that, but he needed to do it at the same time. Oh, it's complicated. <laughs> you can, there, there's, there's a lot of pain in his music and you have to think also of his childhood because, you know, I mean, um, when they moved to, uh, well, in German, it's a Glau, the, the, the town, so people might know it better from for the German town, where, where his parents were uh, starting to be a bit, made, because they, they were very modest at the beginning, but the, now when his father moved there with a family to that town, it's a bigger town, and maybe 20,000 people at the time, it was a very big town, and they, they had a distillery, and it was starting to be, you know, a bit more, Having a little bit more money to send uh, his, his uh, Gustav for piano lessons and eventually to the, to the Vienna uh, Conservatory or uh, Academy. And uh, uh, during that time, you know, he had the, what, there were 12 children that were born that time? There were yeah. a total of 14, but two died right away, but only six survived. So he spent his time with death around him as mm. a child. Like there's yeah. death everywhere. So he has to live inside of himself. He has to find, you know, happiness. It's difficult to find happiness when your siblings keep dying around you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at an age where you, they're really, you're really close. That's all you have. They're, they're not like, I mean, it's never, it's always traumatic. But, you know, if you're five years old, six years old, 10 years old, you know, like a very close brother of his died when mm-hmm. well, it was like 15 mm-hmm. or 14. Yeah. It was like, so it, it was very, he lived a lot with that. So for him to find to believe in something, to believe in something better, something more beautiful, it had to go through this musical experience, you know? He would run away in the forest and he would just like try to, I know it sounds very much like it's, we difficultly relating to it sometimes. They run to the forest, but you know, especially in Toledo, if you've been to the metro parks, oh, yeah. you know, there's so many of them. Like, you know, when I feel, it's not just artists, it's everybody, but when I feel I need a bit of, <sighs> repose time, time to think, or if I'm not feeling that well, I just go in a metro park and I take a huge walk and just absorb everything that's around us. So for him, it was that. So the little sounds he hears here and there, a little bit like Beethoven, you know, sounds of nature, sounds yeah. of the animals, sounds of the water, you know, strolling down the stream. All of that you hear in his music. So it's a sense to try to go back to find uh, a little bit of uh, comfort in that. The music is a comfort. If you take that that sixth movement that Zach was talking about, this is a movement that uh, actually that that was started written. Uh, although the third was really written after the second, but that movement was written a long time before. He started what two, three years before the movement as a as a song, but you can hear it. There's a sense already of uh, something that's lost, but at the same time trying to find the innocence back. It's like he, it's difficult to find your yeah. innocence when there's so many, much trauma in your family mm-hmm. and, and in life, you know. But he's always looking for that, you know. I can imagine, and and listening to the symphony, allowing yourself to be wrapped up in that sound mm-hmm. world, really brings out emotions in you. And like Zach was saying, you know, yeah. you you had difficulty with your emotions just listening to it for the first time when you mm-hmm. were much younger. Yeah. Um, you kind of touch on the the idea of each movement sort of relates to a different thing, and it really fulfills 
that quote of Mahler about every world, every symphony being a world mm -hmm. unto itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got titles for each of these movements. The first one is about summer, then the flowers, what the flowers in the meadow tell me, what the animals in the forest tell me, what man tells mm -hmm. me, what the angels tell me, mm -hmm. and then finally what we've talked about, what love tells me. What, what do you think Mahler is trying to say with this symphony? I, th I think for me, and you, you can tell me what you think about it, but it's part of the, the what we call the human experience, mm. you know? I mean, we're trying desperately to communicate with human, but uh, we're very close to after the, well, not that too bad, the, the romantic era is finishing. This, he, he lives, he, he has a junction, right? He's at the junction, the end of the romantic era and the beginning of the, how do you say, fin de siècle, kind of, yeah. uh, you know, the era of, Turn of the, of the, the century. Yeah, kind of, yeah, and yeah. end of the Austro-Hungarian like uh, influence in the empire, and then the second Viennese school after, you know, the end of all, of many things that people believed in. For example, the end of harmony as we knew it, right? Mm, yeah. With the with Wagner and going uh, modulating from from uh, Mahler into Schoenberg and the second Viennese. So uh, the people who wrote serial music after that saying, well, we have to... Uh, you know, there should be a democracy in notes, and each note will be the same. And, you know, they're trying to find another way because they thought they went as far as they could. And uh, you take, like, you know, something simple. I mean, it's not that simple, but the Tristan chord, the chord, the Tristan chord, which is, uh, you know, minor, seven, flat, five chord. Once you open that, once you have that key and you open that door, there's no way back harmonically. You know, yeah. it's a little geeky what I'm saying, but but still, it's uh, there, there's no way back after that. So you open and you go through, and then, and then what do you do after that? And I think, you know, there's many, you know, there's uh, we're moving already towards eventually, fifty years later, people believing that the medium is the message. You mm -hmm. know, like one radio. So that's yeah. it's funny to say that, <laughs> but in music, but in 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 those times, as the medium is a way to convey the message, right? And that's that's most of the music that people really like from from that era. Is that you know, and and it takes us. It is really at the junction. So there's many things that are uh, uh, contradiction. There's a lot of contradictions in it. So Mahler is always trying to 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 find another human to share that that experience. But it, he's trying to go back to this uh, something that's pure. Yeah. You know, that's uh, like uh, from the eyes of a of a child. You know, because mm, there's, yeah. a, I think there's a part of him that never grew up, you know, seeing all these, uh, there's a part of him that, that was born old and there's a part of him <laughs> that never grew up, you know, that's why he's so complicated. He didn't go sit on the, I don't think he went to see Freud uh, just because of his problems with Alma. I think he had a real crisis, you know, that he wanted to yeah. talk about. And I, I, I don't think it was very nice of her to publish uh, their interview. Anyway, but that's that's my <laughs> that's my. What do thing. you think about that, Effie? You're, you're, you're an expert on those things. Oh, I like everything that Alain has said already. Um, let me dwell for a moment here on two items. The idea of nature, which mm -hmm. is prevalent in many of his compositions, mm -hmm. But scholars always talk about the third symphony as the one that encompasses nature like no other mm -hmm. work yeah. he ever wrote. Because it starts from the inanimate, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the flowers and the animals, and then humankind, and then the angels, and then love. So you have this ascending order of experience that mm -hmm. makes you supposedly better, that you have to aspire to with all these in-between steps. Mm -hmm. And the second idea, which goes hand in hand with nature, is that nature is never happy all mm -hmm. with the time. Nature also has conflicts and has storms and has bad weather yeah. and it has rocks that make you fall down and bleed. Yeah. Uh, and all of these things are in each one of the movements. Each movement has some magnificently lighthearted moment and then all of a sudden, tragedy happens again. Mm -hmm. And we see it very clearly in the second movement, which mm -hmm. is a minuet. Mm -hmm. He's not even writing a Lendler, which was something that he was accustomed to at that time, to write this kind of rustic <laughs> yeah. um, folk, music folk, kind of, yeah. folk dance, right? But he's writing a minuet, and it's so elegant, and it's about the flowers, and it's just graceful. And then all of a sudden, the music changes. <laughs> 
and it's yeah. not a minuet anymore, and there's nothing graceful about it. Yeah. And it happens yeah. in every single movement. There, there are those moments where it's like the cloud comes in front of the sun, and yes. everything gets interior. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so yeah. interesting. I wonder if we might, uh, if you can indulge me for a moment, I, w I want to put all this to the test, but also to listen to some of the music. I, I have um, a little, it's not really a quiz, it's a kind of a special feature, a drop the needle feature, where I'm going to play excerpts from the symphony, and you just have to tell me what movement it's from. If you want to tell me anything more about it, that's fine. <laughs> But uh, the way that we're going to do this is each of you, as we go around the table here, I'm going to ask you to choose a number between 1 and 10, or including 1 and 10, 1 through 10. Choose a number, I'll hit the corresponding clip, and you tell me what it is. We'll let it play out, unless, you know, you recognize it right away. You can say what what part of the symphony it belongs to. Does that sound good to everyone? You want to try it? <laughs> Effie, why don't you pick a number? Between one and ten, and the, you can't. Once somebody picks a number, you can't pick the same number. <laughs> right. So it's it's one in ten, yeah, one, not including Das Lied van der Erde. Uh, exactly, right, one through ten, in honor of Mahler's ten symphonies. <laughs> right? Okay, then Effie, let, pick a number. Then let's go with three. Three. Okay, let's check out three. <laughs> I think you picked an easy one there. That is an easy one. Children's chorus. What uh, what movement is Fifth this? Fifth movement. Fifth uh, movement. They're w imitating the bells, and they're also singing. I can tell you here. I have the text. Uh, they're I think they're singing, singing "Bim Bam Bim Bam." <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could be wrong. <laughs> and then the women's chorus says, yeah. um, three angels sang a sweet song with joy. It blissfully sounded in heaven." They happily rejoiced as well that Peter was free from sin. It has this kind of biblical, uh, the Wunderhorn songs were folk poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have this kind of very simplistic approach to religion and Christianity. So basically, Peter is full of sin and they ask him, why are you here? And Jesus says, oh, you have to be here because you are forgiven. Right. And at the end, heavenly joy there is because... Peter was saved. <laughs> okay, next number. <laughs> Elaine, um, pick one, a number. One. You pick number one? Okay, sure. this is this is fairly short. <laughs> There's that cloud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you just have to tell me what what movement it's, it's, it's in. You obviously know this piece. I don't know. It's it's one of those movements there. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have six guesses. <laughs> it's a movement that doesn't have that many clouds, actually. Yeah, that's six. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So uh, that's a, that's funny because that's exactly what what Zach said before. Yeah. <laughs> it's all of a sudden, whoa! It comes down. Yeah. Yeah. That's but that that's also. Very, it has to do also when I was talking earlier about um, uh, the subconscious in this. Like he's writing, this is a part of also of a sketch of the first. <laughs> there, there, there's part of the sketch yeah. that, that he had there. So, the, oh wow, okay. So it's uh, so it's near the near the last part of it. So you can relate again. We're talking about architecture, the structure of it. So how you relate what you do in the first movement? How do you relate to this part? You put them together. It's. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a big challenge. <laughs> and what comes after this this part mm -hmm. is just pure love. Yeah, yeah, it's indulging mm -hmm. in the sound that I, I would say here that if audiences feel that this is the sound of early Hollywood soundtracks, <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking that, that would actually be very close. when when we just heard the the yeah. clouds passing in front of the sun. Well, there. it's normal when you think the Hollywood uh, school of composing is basically. The continuity of the lineage of, uh, you know, Mahler Strauss, especially, and then Korngold, Korngold and then, yeah. you know, they're all leaving because the Nazis are going to kill them. Yeah. So they come to the United States, they find work in movie music because they're incredibly cross, uh, great craftsmen, and they work very fast. All uh, the musicians and all the physicists yeah. all flood the Nazis <laughs> to yeah. our benefits, yeah. definitely. But, but, but you know that thing with clouds and all that, and especially that, 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 that part that relates a little bit to the first – 
sometimes we see it as dramatic, and I don't think that's what he meant necessarily. It's not drama. It's uh, like if you stand uh, and you see the Alps, let's say, you know, or if you go, uh, if you say to go to Colorado, I mean, you know, the thing that you can relate to in Canada, you go to, to Banff or whatever, and, uh, and you see the, the, all the magnificence of that. And not, not just magnificent, but how imposing it is. Mm-hmm. You know, because that, that uh, sorry, I'm relating to the first again, but it's just that sometimes we think that it's very dramatic, but it's it's not a question, it's not the drama of, you know, a, a theater where something happens to somebody. It's not melodramatic. No. It, it's representative. Exactly, yeah. you know? Anyway, it's... But uh, isn't that an actual quote? Wasn't he talking to Bruno Walter or somebody and he said, shut the window, you don't need to look at the, the mountains because it's all here in my <laughs> Yeah, I know. He did say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very humble guy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so all right. I don't need to go to Banff. <laughs> yeah. Zach, pick a number. Uh, seven. Seven. Here's number seven. Obviously, sort of a waltz-like movement. I think Effie was talking about yeah. this earlier. This two? Two. Yep. I, I'm very bad at needle drops, but I think this is two. <laughs> but you love needle drops. I, I love needle drops. Um, can I tell a quick story? Yeah, tell the story. I had a professor in college who would do the needle drop test, and it would terrify everybody in the class. And I loved it. It was one of my favorite parts. Uh, but back it, it, you know, when it was all like turning into digital, you would just go to the beginning of the movement. So you just had to remember the beginnings. And um, I went back and asked him to make it more hard and go into the middle, just like you're doing right now, Brett. <laughs> and uh, I went back to his office. It was summertime. And he had put together a needle drop test all on Strauss tone poems. Wow. And I was just lost. I couldn't tell if it was Zarathustra <laughs> or Helton Leibman or I, I was completely a wreck. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the same sense of anxiety going through me right now. <laughs> did, did they include the uh, the Alpine Symphony? Alpine Symphony was yeah. there. Yeah. But it wasn't like the summit. It was, um, you know, <laughs> halfway somewhere up halfway the hill. up. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's yeah. interesting. Hmm. But do we want to do another round, or we want to move on? Because I know Zach has prepared a little quiz for us. So, oh, only if only if you wish. Well, what, what do you uh, what do you have there, Zach? I, I'll, actually, I'll bring up one of these uh, one of these clips here and see if we can. Hmm. Okay. This so. is this is the moment that Effie was referring to. Th- this, you know, this love song or yeah. whatever however yeah. you want to characterize yeah. it always reminds me of oh, I'll be, be seeing, seeing you, you. that's right? exactly oh, it yeah. old familiar places <laughs> right yeah yeah absolutely yep. all right Zach what's your quiz <laughs> <sighs> this is gonna be tough to do this over this music okay uh, we can pull it together I have nine questions about uh, Gustav Mahler and they are some are easy and some are less easy. But knowing that I'm with this esteemed group of people, you guys are going to I can play song. something that won't yes, please. be so <laughs> distracting. Yeah. You all recognize this music. This is no a Lance problem. Welcome. We can do anything over that one. That's good. <laughs> Go for it, Zach. Okay, so I have nine questions about Gustav Mahler. Uh, okay. Some are easy, some are more challenging. But knowing this esteemed group of people, we can easily uh, get through all of these correctly, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Just, just let me get Merwin on speed. Yeah, though, well, well, I think we, we have, it's like having the fact checker in this room here. We have Effie, who probably has written more complicated versions of this quiz. Yeah. <laughs> Ghost of Merwin. That. Yeah, right. All right. So uh, we, we'll just start. I think we actually answered this one already. Where was Mahler born? I have multiple choice uh, for all of these. So it's is it Austria? Is it Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany, or Romania? Wow, so there's write four your, choices. That's yeah, so difficult. How, how do we do this? <laughs> write your Just answer say, down. Okay. Oh, do you Which wanna... was part of the Austro-Hungarian yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Empire? Yeah. 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 Okay, go ahead. Um, number two, uh, Mahler's mother, Marie, came from a family known for making what? Potatoes, soap, dice, like the playing cards dice, or perfume? Mm. Wow. That's difficult, Zach. Yeah. How do you make a potato? I guess you could. Well, you could, it, right? you could whip it. You could. <laughs> but, but it was a pretty big region on making soap, so maybe. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many siblings did Mahler have? You actually referred to this already. Is it six, eight, 13, or 15? 
S- siblings that survived to adulthood? Well, siblings. Is that the question? Siblings total. But you didn't say, okay, oh, okay. all right, yeah. I, I was counting Mahler as a sibling. He's not a sibling. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a fun one. I think this is the first sym- symphony, but I could be wrong. Uh, what phrase did Mahler use to describe violinists who were poorly prepared? Did he call them, and these are uh, translations, did he call them passengers, brain deniers, <laughs> banana benders, or lumps of puke? <laughs> Whoa. Man. A, B, C, or D. Well, whatever it is, we're gonna we're gonna call Merwin. That's gonna be his new nickname, yeah. right? Lumps of puke. Yeah. <laughs> Lumps of puke stew. Uh, it's op- it's yeah. bizarre that his orchestra didn't like him. Hey, I can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, number five, uh, the opening of Mahler three quotes what famous other symphony? Is it Mendelssohn four, Brahms one, Beethoven five, or Schumann four? Brahms one. Yeah. And Brahms is alluding to Beethoven's Mm -hmm. Ninth. It's kind of like lineage back, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there are three hammer blows in the Sixth Symphony. Um, I have a list of things. Three of these are represented by the um, hammer blows. Four are not. So which ones are uh, represented by hammer blows? Uh, Number one is, uh, is is it a commentary on the percussionist who like to play loudly? (laughs) Never smile at the percussion. Is it uh, his resignation from the Vienna Opera? His wife's infidelity, number three. Number four, death of his daughter. Five, the critic's cool reaction to his fifth symphony. Uh, six, th- his diagnosis of heart disease. How, how many options are there for uh, this? Last three. one here. Yeah. Yeah, oh, so, yeah, so you choose three of seven here. Uh, or is it a tribute to his friend Heinrich von Mingelberg? <laughs> So Did you just make this up? You made that up, totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know that I, I I usually don't do the third. Uh, there, there's a big uh, the debate, debate about two three, versus two three. three. Yeah, I've never done the third one. I've never of, done the third. Uh, just out of uh, kindness to Heinrich von Mingelberg. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the third <laughs> hammer. <laughs> not, yeah. All right. Question number seven: How many people performed the premiere of Mahler's Eighth Symphony? Seven hundred eighty-eight. <laughs> Eight hundred fifteen. Nine hundred and three. Or 1,030. I was told there would be no math, <laughs> to was quote you. <laughs> it's either A or B. 788, 815, 903, or 1030. Yeah. It was okay. definitely less, fewer than 1,000. Okay, number eight. Uh, two more to go here. So who of the following did not construct a performing version of the 10th Symphony? So this is a not Mahler question? Well, it's not people by Mahler. Be- finishing Mahler, yeah. <laughs> okay. So four choices here. Which one doesn't fit? Uh, Derek Cook, Joseph Wheeler, Clinton Carpenter, or Nicola Bellucci? And last but not least, where was Mahler's last performance as a conductor? Was it Vienna? Was it New York? Hamburg? Or Budapest? New York. All right. I think. Wow. That's okay. a good quiz. Yeah, Effie well, is the winner of the quiz. Yay! <laughs> Congratulations. I'm just sitting back and being amazed at all the answers that you came up with. Yeah, that so, was a, a great quiz. Shall we? Do you want to go through the answers? Do you um, know the answers? Well, yeah. Or do you want to come I, I back didn't and answer do that? any of it, yeah. but uh, I can just make you're it the up quiz as master. We go I don't along. know how the protocol works here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're in charge. You okay. do what you want, Zach. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, number one, Austro-Hungarian Empire. You already referred to that. I think it's present day. Ichlava. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did anybody get that? I got that. Everybody else get it? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Marie Hermann Mahler. Uh, I got that. Family one too. known for soap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the soap. We went with the soap because yep. Elaine. You know. Yeah, you helped us there. Uh, Thirteen siblings, yep. eight of whom died in childhood. So yeah, you refer to that one. I was thinking fourteen, but well, you counted them. I, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, the the quote is um, in the the first symphony preparations that there not be any passengers oh. in the violin section uh. who would not prepare appropriately. Mm. I like the puke thing so much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brahms one opening of the third symphony. Um, Three hammer blows are the resignation from the Vienna Opera, the death of his daughter, and diagnosis of heart disease. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, Effie, you and I might disagree on the number of people in the Eighth Symphony because mm. I have it as uh, 858 singers, soloists, and choruses, 
an orchestra of 171 and Mahler conducting, wow. so it takes us up to 1,030. Okay, maybe I don't remember well. <laughs> maybe wow. that's the 1,000 he right there. absolutely hated the idea of Symphony of a Thousand. Um, who did not construct a performing version of the 10th Symphony was Nicola Bellucci. That's a name I made up in a coffee shop this morning. Uh, Clinton Carpenter was actually Clinton. the first to do it. He was 1949. Oh, really? And then Derek Cook made like a dozen different versions of it between the early 60s and the late 70s. And then Joseph Wheeler made one in the mid-60s. Wow. Good and, job making up names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number nine was, uh, last performance was New York, okay. Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. uh, February 20th, 1911. And it was an Italian-inspired program. So there was Mendelssohn, um, I presume Mendelssohn IV, mm -hmm. uh, Martucci, and... Um, Carpenter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Busoni and uh, Marco Enrico Bassi. And Very nice. Fun fact on that. <laughs> Busoni was in the audience. He was sitting in a box with Arturo Toscanini. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. What wonderful quiz. Yeah. Who do we think won? Oh, Definitely Zach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll give it to Zach. Yeah. See, you have emerged victorious as the quiz master, and finally, for our, for our final episode. <laughs> Took us seven years. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Susan Platts, who's coming back to the Toledo Symphony for Mahler, and she's performed here before. And Effie, you saw the last performance she gave? Yes, I did. Um, and also, I got to meet her. We have a mutual friend. She's a lovely human being, and she's a great interpreter of mm. Mahler's music, yeah. Yeah. which she also acknowledges on her website. <laughs> um, and of course, you, Alain, and Zach know her a lot more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's my, I think, seventh time, seventh concert uh, cycle with her. We did all Mahler each concert. <laughs> so, but in Toledo, it's already the third time, right? Right. Uh, yes, the third time. Mahler second, Das Lied von das der Lied. Erde. Yeah. 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 She was absolutely magnificent in that. And of course, now the third. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. I remember the first time she was here for Mahler too, and you had spoken so highly about her. Mm -hmm. So I went to the rehearsal and I uh, just wanted to hear who this singer was that I liked or not liked so much. Because honestly, mm -hmm. I was nervous what was your Mahler going to be like? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe we agree on everything, but not that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we agree on Mahler. But um, listening to her, I said, I would, I, I, would, I would pay just to listen to the sound she makes when she mm -hmm. is about to sing, because it's just as beautiful as yeah. it, what, what, I mean, it's just, it, it, she has an amazing, amazing instrument. And she's a, a great baker as well. So, you know, that's a lethal combination, a great singer and a great baker, <laughs> yes. right? I think Mahler would approve, definitely. And when we get to that part of the symphony, the fourth movement, mm -hmm. which is just her and the orchestra, it's not just the mystery that Mahler implies with his annotations on the score, but it's, it's deep, uh, and the music is deep. It's, mm -hmm. it's scored for the lower instruments, and it's so static almost. There is mm -hmm. very little going on in the orchestra. And she comes in and out, mm -hmm. uh, and the voice, the, uh, what she voices, you know, Nietzsche's words mm -hmm. are not just about Nietzsche. It's, they're not just about Mahler. They mm -hmm. tell you so much about humanity. Yeah. And, of course, there are many interpretations about why Mahler chose this specific yeah. excerpt. I have a question for Alain. Okay. Third movement. Yes. The so-called post-horn yeah. episodes. Mm -hmm. yes. What are you doing there? Oh. What's, the, uh, what's your approach? You know, He's conducting. <laughs> you, you, you want to know where he is going to be. Yeah. Huh? Yes. That's what you want yeah. to know. Yes. Yeah. Because it's 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 coming from you know from very far. It's coming from the forest. It's kind of, yeah. The player is supposed to be he, away from the. He will be away from the orchestra. We tried. It's interesting that you asked me that question. So with with Zach, our principal trumpet, we tried uh, many many positioning in the hall while we're rehearsing other programs. So uh, for the last month and a half, <laughs> each time we had a little break. So go over there, go to the back of the peristyle, the side of the peristyle, on the side here. So finally, he's going completely to be off stage. He's going to be off stage, uh, uh, Côté Cour, sorry, uh, what's, uh, 
Uh, behind the stage. Uh, well, the, what I'm conducting is going to be on my right. Sorry, uh, yeah, stage right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, no, so, sorry. It's, it's weird. In French, you have one that's called garden and one that's called short. Uh, uh, not short, but the, the court. That's French for you. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and make it more complicated. Just look at the numbering system, right? <laughs> oh, well, let's not get into that because we're going we to do get an into entire and show. Pounds on that. and uh, miles yeah. and okay, go. So, <laughs> you know, metric system. You've heard of it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I've heard of it. Okay. <laughs> so no, it's going to be completely off stage. It's the best sound we found with the door half open. No, we worked on this really specifically. The door completely closed. The door open. The door half open. So the public will hear him. Mm. There's going to be, because you want to have presence, but you don't want to have the, the presence of the articulation right mm -hmm. in front there. And it's interesting, everywhere we tried around in the peristyle, it all sounded the same. Mm -hmm. Like he oh. would be 50 feet from here, so since we're in uh, feet, it would be uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just there. And then it would be like 200 feet. It sounds the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the weight projects and uh, on that ramp uh, on top. So, had. yeah, and then we try to move them here and there. But the thing is that we also have to connect with the rest of the orchestra. The horns play with them and they have a rhythm, you know, they have rhythms that have to mm -hmm. connect you know, together. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the best that we found and also, you know, they're, there's a school of thinking that some people, well, we still want to see the player. You don't need to see the, mm -hmm. the player that much. We're probably going to have a camera not, not far from him. So people who want to see him a little bit might be able to have a few shots of, of him. But at the same time, we don't want to disturb the listening by seeing everything, you know, uh, like behind the, right. behind the curtain, uh, what we do, <laughs> right? So it's the, the magic uh, is the best way the, the magic operates is to have him off stage. Yeah. And it's okay mm -hmm. if we can't see the player. Yeah. The mm -hmm. difference between like the offstage parts for Mahler second, for example, because mm -hmm. it's a full band, Mahler second, that's offstage. All the door closed, pointing the other way. Not pointing. <laughs> He's going to be the door half open, pointing our way. Well, it's a very it's special moment. Yeah. We yeah. really need oh, that, yeah. that, that sound. It's, it's magic. It well, really it's is. interesting because that's where uh, composers before him, and, and often after, they're going to use woodwinds or cuckoo, or they're going to poop, 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 you know, like mm. either some kind of... Uh, what was that again? Uh, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're going to use... You're talking uh, about the clarinets. Uh, yeah, yeah, clarinets or <laughs> flutes, like, like in Beethoven's uh, Sixth Symphony, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have the flute, you're going to have... Uh, or, uh, yes, the clarinet, as you said. But no, this, again, this is a Mahler personification in that it's a very long solo and it's what it tells him you know and it's uh it's interesting because we go from nature you know <laughs> we go from nature to uh, the you know mountains and all that and then flower we go to the animals before going to the human you yes. know yeah. <laughs> when susan will sing yeah. so there's a certain order to nature and you can the order of priorities in this symphony is is values you know yeah. and 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 it's in that nature's values as well so it's uh, it's really interesting after saying all that, you can just sit back and just listen to yeah. it. You don't have to like it's you know you don't have to write a dissertation, but it's good to know what you're getting into. Of course, we'll have the pre-concert chat. You come early if you're going to come to the concert chat because it's pretty full these days. Well, there are two yeah. chances to see the performance, yeah. and I, you know I would almost say people should go twice mm -hmm. to, to That's see. That's what this. I'm doing. Yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's happening uh, Friday and Saturday, June 2nd and 3rd, 8 o'clock p.m. at the Paris style. Alain Trudeau conducting the Symphony Number no. 3 by Gustav Mahler along with Mezzo Susan Platz. And, you know, we could talk about Mahler all day, but we're going to have to cut it short at this point. I want to thank all of you for coming in today. And also, you know, this is our, our last episode. Let me pull up a little music here that is appropriate. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me find something else. I thought you were going to do Old Lang Syne or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So I'm, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Zach. Just say a couple of words about your experience with Toledo Symphony Lab. You know, this is not a goodbye. We're obviously going to keep doing stuff together. But uh, as far as this podcast goes. You know, when we started this, podcasts were not as prevalent as they are now and the ability to create something um, that has turned into uh, moments to share special memories tell stories laugh a lot learn um, I, I couldn't be more proud of what what's happened here and you know to sit with you guys on a on a weekly basis and you know come together even through the pandemic continue to um, kind of pull that curtain back and show what the performing arts is really like. 
We're yeah. not just a bunch of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes penguins, but not often. But, Greg, I, I thank you because you've put your your heart and soul into this program and, and you do a phenomenal job, especially now that I know how difficult it is to make a quiz. But um, your level of preparation and moving things forward has been expert. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Elaine? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Applause for me. <laughs> and Effie, what's your opinion on Symphony Lab? You don't even remember the last time you were here. 19. Yeah. Uh, I you were 19 again, back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for us, for the Toledo Symphony, for people to know a little bit more mm -hmm. and just be inspired you know that's yeah. that's that's what music does it's not always about understanding knowing analyzing you just need to sit back as you said and just mm -hmm. be inspired absolutely go for it I, thank hey if i can say a little something i'd like to thank everybody who's been listening to the podcast over mm -hmm. the years yeah and you know i, I like to say that music is communication and uh, I, we've had a lot of feedback through the years of people who feel that they come to the concert and they, they know what they're getting into a little bit more because they've been listening to the podcast. And that makes me very happy. And I, you know, I, I, I wish that they continue to get uh, the information about the concert. And we're always there to talk to them also. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, just so you know, I'm going to save all of the noises on my soundboard. And when you least expect it, you know, if you hear somebody cheering off in the distance somewhere during a symphony lab, uh, during a symphony concert, it it might be uh, the soundboard <laughs> making an appearance. Yay! <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks to all of you, we've had a wonderful time, and this is going to be such a wonderful concert. I think it's fitting that uh, you're ending the season with Mahler, and you know, I'll give it one last ring here. Our Mahler Bell, <laughs> taking us home here on Toledo Symphony Lab. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org slash lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. And don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony, including their upcoming season. That is at their website, ToledoSymphony.com. You can also look at their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find the TSO's streaming platform online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks to Elaine Trudell, Zach Vasser, and our special guest, Effie Papanicolau. I'm Brad Cresswell, and this has been Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91. Okay, that's Ooh. a wrap. All right. <laughs>